Hi, Hello. we're back. We're back. <laughs> we have three bars on our Zoom recorder. The Zoom is charged. We're ready to go. <laughs> yeah. Dasha. I'm still sick. Yeah. I feel like I'm just going to be sick for the next, yeah. Yeah. Until spring breaks. Yeah, then you're going to get one of those like spring colds that's like more. <laughs> like, it's worse. And funny. Yeah. Um, that's the ASMR for the listeners of my, <laughs> my sinuses. Hard. Um, how are you, Anna? I'm good. Uh, happy aftermath of Holocaust Remembrance Day. Oh, when was Holocaust? Re- I forgot. Uh, like how could a day I? or two ago. Okay. That's why everybody was talking about like the liberated Auschwitz pre- uh, um, prisoners and their like uh, <laughs> uh, elevated longevity. Yeah, you sent me that article about how they yeah. live longer than yeah so um, other types of jews (laughs) um i uh went literally obsessed with surviving they are yeah (laughs) as you said it's not so much that they want to live they just don't want to die exactly (laughs) um yeah the jews are a really spiteful race we should probably edit that out because i'm i'm that's the kind of shit you get kicked off (laughs) patreon for like rolling the dice here um so what else is new um i got my engagement ring reset it looks beautiful thank yeah. you just you know the usual grind going on my degrading audition yeah um what about what's new with you <laughs> um not much i saw the favorite oh cool which is notable because i actually like got my ass off the couch and instead of watching tv here i went to see consumed a movie some media yeah. um consumed like some old school media an um, oscar contender yes yeah, so you were saying that this was one of this is probably the this is the second oscar contender um i've seen after a, a star is born oh yeah you're 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 well on your way yeah i'm not gonna see black panther or black Klansman, and that's not because i'm racist it's just <laughs> neither of those films particularly <laughs> appeals to me um but, i didn't um, see them either i was i was a little bit disappointed this movie had like rave reviews uh-huh and it's from the guy who did dog tooth which i haven't seen but people really love your ghost land the most yeah. did you see the lobster no not yet i'm gonna i'm gonna do the benjamin buttons thing and like go back in time uh-huh. and watch all of his movies in reverse and watch them get progressively better the favorite's I'm, my favorite my favorite of his, really actually i liked dog tooth is clever the lobster is kind of corny i didn't see killing of a sacred deer but i liked the favorite because i like costume dramas me too it seems like the favorite had like all the right ingredients like it had um you know period drama historical costumes lesbian intrigue lesbian intrigue. all of the things that would make for a good film and i thought it was like mostly a good film like 75 percent a good film like i would watch it again but uh-huh. um the ending was kind of whack and phoned in i guess mm. unless unless you see it as like um i'm not i'm gonna try to not spoil no it, spoilers as, unless you interpret it as like the ultimate compromise of uh like what you lose climbing the career ladder yeah the futility of yeah um my only my unofficial review i guess though would be i wish that they had cut out the middleman and done a steamy lesbian scene between the two hotties right <laughs> and i was like i, I don't want to see any of that like if i want to see like a an, an old and young lesbian get together i'll hit the mature category in porn. <laughs> i actually think so olivia coleman who plays the queen is nominated for like lead actress uh-huh and weiss and stone are nominated for supporting oh, so but i squabbling again in real life but i feel like emma stone is truly the protagonist of the movie and has more if not as much, if not more screen time as Olivia Coleman. Yeah. Olivia. Coleman like I think that me as the lead. Emma Stone was really the lead. Yeah. But because like structurally, I suppose she's supporting, but yeah, she that, already won for lead for La La Land. Oh, she did. She, I mean, that movie was like a, about a scrappy young liberal feminist, just trying to like make, make like ends meet in the world. The she's like really leaning into the queen's pussy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's about, um, cutthroat lesbos yeah i did think like man i wish we it would be so great to live in a patriarchy 
mm. and have <laughs> just like husbands because then you can just you know the whole novelty of chasing after men would wear off and you would just be left to your natural devices which would be to become a lesbian right which would make life easier for everyone a true patriarchy yeah <laughs> um so that's that did you ever have to read that essay in college about how all how um heterosexuality is compulsory no yeah, maybe that was a women's college thing it was about how women all women are naturally lesbians well they're because they're naturally bisexual which is why i thought it was redundant when um kristen cinema kristen skinamax came out as the first <laughs> bisexual senator <laughs> like literally every woman senator before you has been bisexual exactly <laughs> don't think they didn't muff dive at their women's bella colleges. thorne came out as bi as well wait recently i thought this was, it was years a, it ago. was a few years ago yeah. um wait so this essay who wrote the essay oh i don't remember it wasn't Dworkin, but it was one of those okay i had to read it in like a feminist philosophy class mm -hmm. and that's when i first started to have my doubts about this feminism stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah um a friend of the pod heidi matthews gave me a hot tip today which is that mm -hmm. this woman Kristen cinema mm -hmm. is under fire because she dressed like a hooker because she wore thigh high boots yeah <laughs> yeah you sent me that and who is like, she where what um what state um i i don't we know, don't know. <laughs> go <with> nevada <laughs> um, good for her i this is something i would ordinarily be outraged about as like a uh young male conservative moralist but literally every <laughs> po female politician in italy was either a, a, a prostitute or a porn star like before Chicholina. they got, yeah before they went into politics so it's like fine um my main beef with uh her uh arizona, oh, arizona. so close, close you were very close <laughs> she definitely looks like she's from fucking arizona yeah. um uh, a real lot lizard <laughs> She, but these she, boots um, these ariana grande style they're boots. hideous they're not even stuart white whitesman they're she like, looks um, bad dsw shoe warehouse the thing is like i don't mind dressing like a hooker uh-huh it's just if you're gonna do it look like a you know a couple thousand dollar a night hooker not like a twenty dollar a night hooker come on you're representing the great state of arizona, <laughs> arizona. here <laughs> she just like the boots were bad the the outfit was horrible um, and now there's also people are mad at, um, at AOC for, uh, dropping her skincare routine on Instagram stories. Um, are people mad or are you mad, Anna? No, no, people, <laughs> certain people are freaked out. <coughs> Other people are like, yes, queen. Um, cause she's already, she already sort of has come out in favor of self care. Oh yeah. Did she say this? Like literally huh she said this that she likes self-care yeah i think i mean my thing about it is that she's like, talked about doing face masks and stuff before okay as our millennial representative my thing is that this is like a just a slightly less corny more uh maybe topical version of what Hi hillary was doing with chilling in cedar rapids and like doing the dab it's like playing up to a certain constituency that aoc has already won like namely self-care leftists and liberals in new york city like uh -huh. we already are on board with her program right but i think that that kind of thing if a actual poor black and latino people in the bronx <laughs> saw that which they probably wouldn't they would be offended and i know it sounds i don't know if they would be if they would be confused they maybe. would be confused but i know it sounds like maybe like a little uh kooky but um I, I am at the end of the day not i not so much of a contrarian as a moralist and i think that there's <laughs> something intuitively morally wrong with a politician sharing their skincare routine it's gross i mean i i sure. storied in response like you know just keep in mind that politicians are not your friends they're not your enemies they're not celebrities they're um they're basically here to represent your interests yes you are their constituents. They work for you, not the other way around. Like we shouldn't be fawning over AOC. And I think Amber said this back in the day, but the, the virtue of AOC, if any, is not that she's like cool or hot or anything about her as a person. It's that she's helping normalize progressive ideas totally. to a mainstream audience. Yeah. Um, 
and also friend of the pod wade i was talking to him about uh-huh. this and he said something brilliant quoting his staunchly republican uncle which uh-huh. is um uh never vote for anyone who wants to get elected <laughs> <laughs> and like that's the problem with all of these democratic and social democratic politicians sure she wanted to get elected too hard i mean they all want to get elected i know but they shouldn't that's why at the end of the day i have like mucho (laughs) respect for bernie because i don't think he actually gives a fuck he wants to get elected as a means to an end he doesn't really care about himself definitely yeah he's been running every year yeah (laughs) but not in like a pathetic desperate way like hillary no just a consistent um vermont kind of way like functional mechanical sort of way um that's why i actually think i'm a better socialist than aoc because i didn't leverage my sailor social sailor socialism virality into a political career and instead (laughs) became a provocative podcaster yeah (laughs) but that's the thing i was thinking about this it's like it would be totally I don't think I would ever do this necessarily, but like, okay, I take a lot of selfies and stuff like that. And it would yeah. be totally reasonable if somebody like you or me uh, tweeted out or Instagram storyed our skincare routine because we're literally like podcasters, but it's not, it's a little morally murky when a politician does it. And I know there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be like, oh, like, that's just harmless. It's harmless fun. And people said this about selfies. And even though I take a lot of them, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't believe that they're harmless. I actually think that they toxic. are toxic. Uh-huh. It's another one of those instances of, like, competition masquerading as solidarity and more broadly, like, social media acting as a pressure valve for political frustration. And indicative of wider trends of yeah. narcissism and cultural decay. Yeah, and it's like we're all guilty, and I'm not here to like police anyone and be like, no, you cannot take selfie. You but cannot like, sk- do skincare. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, like AOC, like she's obviously a pretty woman. She could wear a burlap sack and people would notice, but I don't think that should be, I don't think it is her platform, but it shouldn't be also. Um, like we shouldn't get blinded to the fact sure that she's representing us also i mean is her skin i wasn't really that interested in her skincare routine. <laughs> yeah i wasn't either and then it wasn't particularly it was like she does two-step cleansing which is what she uses an oil-based <laughs> cleanser and then okay. like another one um it wasn't that interesting of a skincare routine is really the you know <laughs> well she's not that <laughs> was interesting my of a person that's the secret like she's just cute um but yeah i don't she's know she's an every girl she's that's an every girl like yeah her. that's cute i've never heard of that uh expression did you make i think up? i just made it okay up. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's better than glossier um but yeah what i will say about like the um kind of Kristen cinema and aoc shakeups is that like mm-hmm. yes like <laughs> boundaries and standards are artificial but that doesn't mean they're not beneficial like there's a reason you shouldn't wear hooker boots on the senate floor and there's a reason you shouldn't leak your skincare routine as like a uh politician like what's next like cat filters maybe she should do the the puppy dog puppy dog i do anal in the first day <laughs> filter and really like normalize her presence yeah i want to hear about her sex life yeah um she works too hard to have sex she has a schlubby boyfriend she does Uh uh-huh like um a dsa kind of guy he's like a i think he's in tech but not in a um not at one of the sinister ones or maybe he's not he's like i looked him up recently he's a redhead um (laughs) okay Okay. that's all that's all the information i have this is why why um uh, AOC should be immediately impeached already. If you're, <laughs> if you're dating a ginger and a tech bro, I don't trust you. Um, so yeah, um, shall we go move yeah, on to what's on the doc? The New York Times um, piece about millennial toil culture, right? Oh yeah, hustle culture, which is by uh, Aaron Griff- Griffith, who's a mm. tech reporter. She dubs it um, kind of the hustle culture and talks about like the hustle grind repeat ethos. Um, why millennials are obsessed with working or why why are millennials pretending to love to work? Yeah. 
Um, uh, and it's about basically like people who treat work not as a means to an end, but as an end unto itself. Right. Um, I liked the the part where she talks about how um, hustle culture, as she says, is obsessed with striving, relentlessly positive, devoid of humor. And once you notice it, impossible to escape. Dot, dot, dot. From this point of view, not only does one never stop hustling, one never exits a kind of work rapture in which the chief purpose of exercising or attending a concert is to get an inspiration that leads back to the desk. So all leisure activities are secondary and only legitimate if they improve your productivity at work. Right. She talks about Elon Musk sort of advocating for the 80 to 100 hour work week. And there's a photo of um, some cucumber water at <laughs> WeWork um, onto which someone carved, don't stop when you're tired, stop when you are done. <laughs> when you're dead, I'll, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Um, are um, millennials pretending to love work i don't know any millennials who pretend well, to love we work we don't because we are, are part of like a lazy milieu yeah like we we run a podcast that records twice a week one hour each day <laughs> we can barely muster the energy to <laughs> enthusiasm to put out this content i have um, to take the g to the f to get here and yeah okay. me too um oh wait i take the f to the g right. yeah uh, <laughs> it's like 30 minutes door to door we're real pieces of shit but um and all our friends are you know unemployed or yeah or drug dealers <laughs> or also <laughs> podcasters or sex workers <laughs> <laughs> i guess we don't have any any friends we don't have any girl boss friends but i do think there is there's definitely like a dominant narrative mode of like look how hard i'm working yeah that's true i mean you can see it if you ever go to flat I mean, iron we, sure which is a giant corporate park at this point like it's like i go to flat iron almost every work day for audition oh to to, to your my to agency, your agent yeah um but there's like it's it's very yeah, it, kind of vertically integrated like in in a literal sense like you work upstairs at your office and you go downstairs to like the bandier boutique buy some yoga pants yes go over here to like um soul cycle and then go to di swerve. dig in or chopped <laughs> yeah. or <laughs> sweet green and it's like that whole same aesthetic i do think that erin griffith is a little tad bit wrong it, that it's not lately it's that work culture hasn't been unanimously relentlessly positive you st you start to see a little kind of like quirky negative one-liner jabs coming into that culture huh. like i can't think of anything specific but people like make fun of themselves for working now a little bit uh-huh sure i would so never it's becoming kind of like brand sentient and self-aware um what would you do if we didn't have our podcast um, I, I mean, I really would consider... Would you go back to hostessing? Um, I don't think that I could go back to hostessing. I would probably uh, go... I would maybe consider going back into academia or I would just become a prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why not? Well, academia is not exactly lucrative it's not lucrative but it's it's, it's uh, a way of insulating yeah but at least i could i could have i could like read books or something um well she made an interesting point where she contrasted it to sort of the gen x like slacker culture mm -hmm. um how that was is basically non-existent mm -hmm. of the sort of like office space slackers you know yeah like workplace the, indifference yeah which I think was much more, in some sense, it was much uh, more honest and therefore less soul crushing. But well, because like, things were less precarious. You could depend on having a job that you didn't care about and you didn't have to kill yourself pretending to care. Right. And um, you can have, you know, there's that famous scene in um, Office Space where the three protagonists smash some office equipment, like a printer with the like fact, baseball yeah. bats and stuff. And now you literally have that codified, like institutionalized into like something like escape rooms, <laughs> which like you pay to smash things. Do you smash things in escape yeah, rooms? Yeah, you do. Yeah. I walk oh. past one and they have like fake brick and like kind of like really cheap glass bowls uh -huh. and plates and like a printer or something. Um, and that's, 
that's just like it's the logical conclusion but it's in some ways that gen x uh indifference and on we paved the way for this because like this whole class of like early entrepreneurs were like well how can we make the office a, mu- a much more fun and inclusive space mm-hmm. get so, some um yoga, yeah. yoga balls and ping pong tables yeah like a beanbag chair uh-huh. and like a beer mini for like artisanal micro brew mini fridge <laughs> but they literally tore down the cubicle which people saw as emancipatory and built these open office spaces and i think it was like dan allegretto who tweeted like this really funny um a tweet that was like a tiny little closet that was a private mm-hmm. space module for the open office <laughs> <laughs> and you know you see like work culture as becoming from kind of ford and taylor onward as becoming like a culture of uh being served it's like a how would you say it like it, it's the move from being surveilled by your boss or your master to self-surveillance now right. employees are are snitching on one another and in fact snitching on themselves because it's panopticon baby yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> but you don't yeah you don't have to have like a foreman who makes you work 60 hours a week because you'll do it yourself yeah and that's you're like, on your hustle <laughs> yeah and that's like kind of the sad um the sad thing about this she also compared it to soviet propaganda um she she says but today as tech culture infiltrates every corner of the business world it's hymns to the virtues of relentless work remind me of nothing so much as soviet era propaganda which promoted impossible seeming feats of worker productivity to motivate the labor force um one obvious difference of course is that all those Stakhanovite posters had an app anti-capitalist bent criticizing the fat cats profiting from free enterprise mm-hmm uh, th- that to me was a little bit of also a missed opportunity because it's not so much that they had an anti-capitalist bent it's that they had a collectivist bent because the soviets were talking ab- about the collective project of building a society not advancing your own interests with the ultimate purpose of like lining of becoming like an entrepreneurial yeah but in in mogul in the end the, the people that benefit from all of this like Entrep- misguided misplaced entrepreneurial energy are p- the people who are already rich enough not to be entrepreneurs right like all, the entrepreneur culture is really terrifying because it's it's also a way of like re- rebranding precarity and adversity as something I mean, like right. positive uber drivers have some, sometimes yeah. have like an entrepreneurial mindset yeah it's like that horrifying um a collection of of headlines like oh about like the one about the woman who was nine months pregnant and went into labor and took one last ride before driving herself to the hospital (laughs) or those fiverr those extremely alienating fiverr ads yeah and this is something that people like jill lapore and kate loss were writing about maybe two three four five years ago like and it's really interesting to see this like tech backlash getting normalized finally 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 yeah and it's it you know people are starting to get wise to the fact that as she puts it it's grim and exploited it <laughs> but that's but that's i think the essential animus of neoliberalism is rebranding precarity as opportunity right and like uh community or sorry competition as community and uh transparency as democracy and activity as efficiency and all these things that it's not and you see like all in the business models um and she also talks about like why this is and how people w- like people our age when they're not working they feel guilty mm-hmm. like not they me. have a, what <laughs> not me <laughs> um this is like more of a male thing i don't think so I mean, maybe not but i think not like, anymore a lot of a lot of people start to bristle if they go on like vacation yeah cuz they can't stand like not working in some way sure um but yeah, I mean, once again, it's like the distinction between work as means the means to an end and work as, as uh, an end unto itself, which is a distinction that Tucker Carlson made in that salon interview, which we mm-hmm. will get to momentarily. Well, she says also um, just the w- how work is something that creates meaning in people's lives in lieu of, again, precarity, like people can't have... Um, families or meaningful relationships. Yeah. So work kind of ends up being the only thing. 
Yeah. And another thing that she touches on um, is, is the idea that it is the, this whole fetishism of work is a defense mechanism against the fact that it's not so much that people don't want families and kids and leisure time. It's that they can't have it and they right. can't afford it. So you so, pretend that you're just on your grind. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to like erect an, an elaborate edifice of, of delusional rationalizations. It reminds me of the whole antinatalist movement. Mm-hmm. This whole like flagellating leftist idea that like actually it's bad for society for you to have kids. And so you should deny yourself and mm-hmm. not procreate. Which also, I mean, we, the handmaid's tale yeah you know it creates this whole dystopia where you're forced to procreate (laughs) as opposed to confronting the real life dystopia where you can't yeah exactly and like my i mean my hunch about it is that capitalism and like neoliberalism is like a particularly aggressive form of capitalism they only kind of exacerbate psychological qualities or qualities of human nature that that basically have always existed Mm -hmm. like the reason that people flee to work is because they don't want to be trapped with their family (laughs) (laughs) like would you rather be like a girl boss creating the illusion of progress by answering emails at the dinner table or like talking in cordial npr voices with your husband who you hate and who you have no semblance of a sex life with (laughs) god I wish we didn't have to choose. Yeah. <laughs> we can't have it all. Um, is is there anything else that we want no, to say about I think that? About pretty much, we've covered it in the failing. That's, the that's failing it. We're New done. We'll time. see you in hell. Um, <laughs> um, just remember. it also it's also a very distinctly um, New York phenomenon. I think. right. Um, it's people in Los Angeles are much more comfortable. I mm-hmm. think idling and then I think in the rest of the country I mean would you do you most really people think are unemplo- that? unemployed when I was in Los Angeles mm. I noticed a suspicious number of people wearing yoga pants but uh, da- dilly dallying on their macbooks with like disproportionate expressions of intensity like they were doing something like oh that's serious? because they can't read <laughs> like it's screen. really hard for them to um no but people are, are you know pursuing like screenplays and more there's more delusion creative yeah which comes out of leisure i think Mm -hmm. there's definitely more of a leisure culture in california Mm -hmm. um not to say that millennials aren't you know working themselves to death all over the place but it is like you know flat like a a flat iron phenomenon yeah and then you know she does talk about like this incongruity but of popular perception that like millennials are lazy and entitled, but also that they're literally working themselves to death. Right. I saw sponsored ads recently for like a bed desk. So you can like (laughs) (laughs) work while you're in bed. It's like a basically a breakfast tray, but that goes across your entire bed. It's like a lazy Susan that (laughs) spins all of your devices. So you never have to stop. They should make a sex desk. I knew this culture was terminally ill when they came up with the standing desk, which is the most <laughs> undignified thing I've ever seen. It's better for your back, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> um, as my sister once... Doesn't Forrest use a standing desk? He would. He would. He would. Um, <laughs> shout out to friend of the poor pod, Forrest, uh, upon whose rug we are now resting. <laughs> um, no, my, I remember my sister once said, you know, I feel like a towering monstrosity at my uh, standing desk. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, but that's just like, it's so sad and undignified, like all of tech culture being forced to mingle mm-hmm. with your coworkers. Constantly. At like, uh, uh, you know they have like those thursday kind of like, like after work. they like it and people, how who, much people who work at like google and airbnb and shit don't have any real friends they don't have real friends they love to nothing more than to drink kombucha on top with their coworkers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i mean like name your price Dasha, play, for like, how much cards you would against humanity yeah that's like the like all of that that whole culture like how much would you have to be paid to hang out at an office with your coworkers? <laughs> well uh a lot i guess um a hundred thousand dollars a year <laughs> that would be, would like that your, be your worth it? i don't know i don't know if that would even be 
worth it? Because what would I do with that money? You know, um, spend it on clothing and drugs. But you wouldn't because you would. Yeah, but I'm like my summer luck, Anna. I'm like interested. I got some spawn con on Instagram <laughs> last night for like pajamas that you can wear outside. Uh-huh. And that's really your look. I think I was like, wow, someone the algorithm is working because they know exactly what I want. And I want to wear like an expensive nightgown around the clock. <laughs> yeah, like braless in an expensive <laughs> nightgown. Um, um, and I don't think I could do that. My office is Lucien. I don't think I could do that. At the office? At Airbnb. At Airbnb. Well, if if a uh, U.S. senator can wear hooker boots on the Senate floor, you can wear a negligee <laughs> I tried to your to corporate get, office. I tried to get a corporate job out of college uh-huh. in San Francisco. And I was um sorely unprepared for the labor market yeah and found out i was actually pretty unemployable (laughs) i think that there's like uh just something about me that doesn't no no one wants even to be like yeah even to be like an administrative assistant i couldn't con anyone into getting me a desk job yeah of course i mean i think that people look at people like us and they're like this person has no semblance of a work ethic or the social etiquette needed to like talk to uh, (laughs) other representatives of like ibm or samsung commercial interests yeah but it's like it's really sad because it i mean it's true that there needs to be a work-life balance as gay as it sounds because you can't just hang out all the time (laughs) like even i get a little crazy when i like just like go from like shopping to drinking or something (laughs) (laughs) but at the same Uh time like well that's why i work in the entertainment industry yeah because that's your job that's my job yeah it's like socializing yeah Mm -hmm. um and but there is this kind of like relentless push that's like really disturbing uh, that's basically constant rebranding like you see this with companies like creative agencies are always rebranding um you know uh all sorts mm-hmm. of firms are just like they it, they mentioned kind of like Spotify, which is like, a, you know, an engine through which you listen to music. Mm-hmm. They have like one of these like really inspirational, and uplifting mission statements. And so does Dropbox, which is like a, a, a server through which you download files. Yeah. <laughs> which I pay nine ninety nine a month for, even to though use. I never use it. Yeah. I don't even know how to use it. But all of these. Um, all these companies have sort of like slogans or mantras that are like changing the world Mm -hmm. through enlightened information harvesting like (laughs) gathering or something and you're like what (laughs) just say that you help people download stuff or like listen to stuff creativity is the big is the big buzzword yeah and there's like i think what what has to what there has to go on is there has to be like a serious interrogation of this like stupid western enlightenment um concept of progress that we're essentially progressing Mm -hmm. which is like the steven pinker idea like things are getting better when they're really kind of they are by certain metrics but also they're not by other ones and then also that technological advancement necessarily means social progress because most of the time it doesn't yeah if it's in the hands of like capitalist overlords um speaking of which Howard Schultz announced uh, a, that he is going to run for president as an independent. Yeah. Uh, former CEO of Starbucks? Or yes, former, yeah. I love Starbucks. I'm he a really Donuts did, girl myself, but yeah, we're like the, yeah. He really did something right um, over at Starbucks. <laughs> but uh, people think that if he does end up running he will ensure a Trump victory. Yeah, a lot of people are saying this is the nail in the coffin that will siphon off um, undecided votes and sort of uh, seal the deal for Trump's re-election um, after like Kamala Harris derails Bernie in the primaries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, after she breaks his kneecaps and puts yeah. him in jail um, <laughs> for truancy but you were saying that this is not necessarily the case i don't think he will i think he will drop out um 
like before a primary even yeah possibly but you were also saying that unlike so he's you you were saying that he's socially liberal but he's socially liberal economically conservative he basically has very vague policy plans anyway he has no experience Mm -hmm. um which obviously did not hinder our fear uh donald trump but um yeah i read an article in the washington post that sort of broke down the 2016 electorate um and the sort of quadrant he fell in socially liberal economically conservative makes up like four percent of voters because obviously only very rich people (laughs) feel that way and that the sort of contested um electorate are people who are socially conservative and economically liberal sort of the populist quadrant yeah the populist quadrant which is much more of a mixed um, blue and red bag whereas the rest sort of fall where you'd expect them to Mm -hmm. um the article went on to say that like he probably spends a lot of time with people who share his worldview and economic interests so he doesn't realize actually how out of touch he is um I mean, the guy has like a messiah complex. When I was re- I was reading an a CNN mm-hmm. interview with um, um, this guy Scott Pelley, and I was like, this is like a prime example of uh, you should not vote for anyone who wants to get elected. He wants to get elected because he thinks like he, he wants to be president, just like Hillary. Right. Like, it's been he my thinks day, in my yeah. dream since day one. <laughs> I w- should be president because I want to. Yeah. Um. Um, yeah he thinks because he's it's classic bajillionaire delusion well yeah he sounds like a bridezilla it's like (laughs) i deserve the wedding of my dreams because i've earned it and it's like no you haven't you're not entitled you're a shitty person and it's funny (laughs) because in the interview he says he says something to the effect of he basically brands donald trump as uh, unqualified for the presidency and i'm like dude you're incriminating yourself because how are you any different from donald trump in any material sense like sure right. you have more progressive views about like mexicans lgbtq and women. people yeah. right you think that lgbtq <clears throat> people should be customers at starbucks to use your restroom <laughs> congratulations <laughs> um, but like he he you know and i was like i how is this like any better but i i have an idea which uh-huh. is like you know how you should you know like you can't run for president um if you weren't born in this country yeah which is like uh makes sense i guess i propose the electoral criteria that you should not be eligible to run for the presidency if you have ever been involved it with or worked for a corporate entity i mean great by that by that (laughs) token trump would be disqualified too Uh but there should be strict delineations between politicians and businessmen because collective and corporate interests don't mix Mm -hmm. and in the rare case that they do coincidentally you get something like woke commercials in lieu of a living wage which is like a good tweet you had a couple of days ago or whenever after the gillette thing yeah and it's like (laughs) there of course there are like instances when the imperatives of social justice warriors and uh techno capitalists dovetail together and everybody can be happy and it becomes a super bowl commercial or something (laughs) but like that's like so far away from what's actually happening on the ground um he also um talks about his journey in quotes this is the npr interview this is a cnn interview or maybe it's like an excerpt of the npr Uh interview on cnn i don't know Uh uh-huh but he talks about his journey about how, which is basically like kind of in, in a tight lipped fashion, revealing how his dad used to beat him, but also took him to Yankee games. <laughs> and, and this is like, sounds from, presidential yeah, from his new memoir from the ground up. And that's another criteria. If you've written an autobiography right. before you run for office, you don't deserve to be president. Definitely. That's like, like I'll co-sign I get, that. I'll grant that Barack Obama has earned the right to write an autobiography. <laughs> Michelle Obama, however, yeah. not interested. Um, but he, there was like a really chilling part where the guy asked him that, you know, 
what does a coffee entrepreneur know about being a commander in chief? Uh And his response was, I have a long history of recognizing I'm not the smartest person in the room that in order to make great decisions about complex problems, I have to recruit and attract people who are smarter than me and more experienced, more skilled. And we've got to create an understanding that we need a creative debate in this room to make these kind of decisions. So this sounds like something like Tim Cook or Steve Jobs would say. (laughs) He's basically he hired one of George W. Bush's campaign advisors. Okay, well, speaking of yeah, surprise, surprise. dumbasses <laughs> who are open to suggest taking suggestions from people smarter, aka more evil than them. But he he's basically talking about running the government, running the country like a business, which is what Obama did before him, and what Trump is currently doing. Um, and we've seen how that that's going. So let's give him a shot. <laughs> let's give him yeah. <laughs> it's his campaign advisors are like um dick cheney like an algorithm of like richard nixon and Mm -hmm. like um john legend or something (laughs) (laughs) it's like chrissy teigen's twitter feed um did you see the trump tweet (laughs) no I'm not on Twitter anymore. Right. I'm actually really going to appeal this because I miss Twitter. Good. You should, you should come yeah, back. I miss it. It's not fair. I, I at least want those cocksuckers. Sorry. Those wonderful, benevolent, socially <laughs> at conscious. Jack. Yeah. At Jack. I just, at the very least, I want my archive back. You deserve it. I Anna. deserve it. There are so many gems in there. I know. It really sucks. It's a, it's a real injustice. <laughs> yeah. Um, So Trump said Howard Schultz doesn't have the, in quotes, guts to run for president. Watch him on 60 Minutes last night and agree with him that he is not the, quote, smartest person. Besides, America already has that. I only hope that Starbucks is still paying me their rent in Trump town. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. He rocks. He's right. He's right. Yeah. Howard Schultz doesn't have the guts because he drinks so much coffee. His like insides are like, he probably doesn't even drink coffee. I bet he doesn't. He's like one of those guys. He definitely doesn't drink Starbucks. Yeah. He definitely does not. (laughs) Like the real working class. He he drinks La Colombe. Like the socially conservative, economically liberal folks do. He was also like prattling on about um, how uh, he, you know, will be honored to be like the first Jewish president Uh because Obama, you know, we have a precedent of electing a black guy to be our first black president Mm -hmm. president. And I was like, but but we already have a Jewish president. We've got him baby. (laughs) Um, we already had a black president in Bill Clinton. Howard Schultz thinks he's like a benevolent corporate overlord, Mm -hmm. but he's probably a lizard. Just the rest of them. Um, yeah, he's a person who's like so convinced of his goodness Mm -hmm. that he would um shepherd people into like concentration camps (laughs) but with like beanbag chairs and micro fridges (laughs) internment camps i mean it's just like kind of like bizarre and incongruous that a person who has spent his entire life climbing the corporate ladder would think that he knows what's good for uh for america for the country for like a um a state of people um yeah at the end of the day though that this is like what uh politics has become because people like actual kind of like died in the wool politicians like bernie Mm -hmm. or or somebody like ralph nader even Uh are basically like clipped like their wings are clipped like kind of at like a kind of intermediary uh part point in the political process Uh uh-huh like those guys so then it just leaves like the rich people to fight over who's going to ruin poor people's lives (laughs) more yeah (laughs) um and my thing you know it's like i i hate to come out against um daddy but i think people like roger stone made it really impossible for po- like they were really the nail in the coffin for politics to function in any sort of like equitable way i mean it was already bro- a broken system i think the two-party system is inherently questionable and so is liberal democracy sure but um the kind of and our uh, whole electoral system obviously. yeah but but the idea kind of 
the functional like the fact that that lobbies and super PACs run our uh, mm-hmm. political system is troublesome on like a pragmatic level but also that in, in the optics sense that people th- find uh, th- that people are told that they can find kind of wisdom and leadership from corporate henchmen right but that- in general i'm not a po- like i'm not opposed to third party candidates if you think that there is a risk of them splitting the vote Mm -hmm. then it's just evidence that the whole thing should change well right exactly i think the existence of third party candidates really like uh brings into sharp relief that it'll just force democrats to actually stand for something and be better yeah i don't know that it ever will no it's (laughs) it's not going to because they're like doing i mean they're doing more of the same i guess we've been over this with like um, you know, even with that video of uh, uh, Hillary like reviving the Bernie bro narrative or something like mm-hmm. that. Um, but yeah, should we move on to Tucker Carlson? Right. Speaking of socially conservative economic liberals, <laughs> yeah. uh, um, Tucker Carlson did an interview with Salon uh, in response to like an editorial he wrote mm-hmm. where he espouses some pretty left-wing at least economic ideas Mm -hmm. he reads um jacobin magazine and that he would consider voting for elizabeth warren he says by the way i'm with elizabeth warren on this she wrote a whole fucking book about it she wrote a whole book on this called the two income trap and she made the case that when our society changed in such a way that it took two incomes to support a family everybody got poorer and less happy yeah so he's basically um making a case for the patriarchal mode of mm-hmm. existence when the man was the breadwinner and the woman was uh, a stay at home mom, or at least that's what it looks like on the surface. But I actually think like um, Carl, he's making a much more nuanced and interesting point, which is that, uh, you know, oh, the woman can be working and the da- the dad can be the stay at home dad. Right. But that's but not the- what he means. Of course that's not, but he, but Tucker Carlson is actually very interesting to the degree that he says things that are very nuanced and complicated in that way that, and it's something that the, the left in general is like allergic to. I mean, he's basically as, as the guy who, who did this interview, Matthew Roja, Mm -hmm. he's, he was like, well, you know, this guy's an enthusiastic Trump supporter. He hosted Roger Stone immediately after his indictment. Yeah. (laughs) Um, he's been accused of spreading noxious white nationalist uh, ideas and beliefs into the mainstream. He loves to own SJ dubs. Yeah. His like, yeah, his whole platform is about that. So it seems shocking to this guy that he would espouse anti-capitalist ideas. Mm -hmm. But like, as it turns out, people on the far right and the far left, people on the extreme fringe, like we've said before, are much better at the very least at, at, um, diagnosing the ills of a society. Um, than people on the center left, including rad libs. And right. like, you know, I, I wouldn't trust a, an Islamic fundamentalist for anything, but I would trust them to diagnose, not prescribe the ills of American society much more accurately than I would a Kamala Harris or Hillary Clinton supporter. And diagnostically, he's mostly spot on. He talked, he was on a tangent about marijuana mm-hmm. um, and like rehab's not working. Mm-hmm. That's a little too socially conservative for me but basically he's talking about tax breaks he's talking about having like a progressive tax policy yeah and he i mean he did make the really important point that is an overlooked point that like nobody talks about the tax rate and how determining that is Mm -hmm. in like in like literally determining your behavior like where you choose to live who you choose to marry whether you choose to get Mm -hmm. married even whether you choose to have kids where you send the kids to school, like all these like major, major life decisions. Um, he, and he's kind of like one of the few people talking about it. And I know that there are a lot of people on the left who are of the mind, like don't be fooled. He's just kind of doing a very strategic conservative thing, which is um, get paying lip service to leftist ideas to like recruit people. Why? And then kind of like jokes on them in the end because the Republicans will continue to push through their like shitty draconian taxation policies. Uh But I actually, you know, don't necessarily uh, think that's the case. I mean, I'm going to go out mm -hmm. on a limb and say that 
actually guys like Tucker Carlson and also incidentally guys like Joe Rogan or Jordan Peterson or Sam Harris, these guys that we love to make fun of for being like bozos. Mm -hmm. Those guys are much more interested in discourse in plurality, even if they don't like censorship and have a persecution conflict complex, they're much more interested in discourse than your average leftist who is only interested in, uh, self affirmation. Sure. And like, you know, if, if, even if you take Tucker Carlson with a grain of salt, mm -hmm. which you should, which I guess. you should, he's like a fat guy in a bow tie. He reminds me <laughs> of that Russian cartoon Carlson. Remember the guy that used to like yeah. spin in the air? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but like Tucker Ka Carlson, Cocker, <laughs> Cocker Carlson. Um, 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 and I like, I really liked what he said when he said, um, uh, I would never make the case that racism doesn't exist or that it's not a factor. Of course it does. And it is, but in the end our racial or sex differences are immutable differences that can't be fixed. They can't be changed. They're set at birth. So it's not only counterproductive, but in my opinion, it's an intentional diversion away from conversations about things that we could potentially change like tax rates. And I mean, I, I agree with what he's saying mm -hmm. there because he's saying that, yes, there are certain differences uh, between uh, sexes and races and stuff like that but it is in our collective interests to improve tax rates so everybody sure. can get a leg up and that this whole id poll thing is a distractionary tactic which it is it's meant to sow division among people who are equally precarious um and he talks about sort of Republicans needing to part with this almost religious worship of the free market mm -hmm. and to actually look at who their constituents are, who are like the rural poor at this point, who are people right. who are like living in pretty much extreme precarity. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an opioid academic, epidemic, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and that they've sort of lost touch with like that now basically democrats are the party of the extremely affluent mm -hmm. and republicans essentially don't represent anyone right um but then he goes on to say that socialism is a disaster it doesn't work it's what we should be working desperately to avoid and socialism is exactly what we're going to get and very soon unless a group of responsible people in our political system reform the american economy in a way that protects normal people well what well this is my and question. i don't know what that he what does that mean that to look what like. yeah, yeah what does that look like i mean we have a hybrid capitalist social welfare state where uh social welfare is constantly under assault but there are you know uh safety nets and uh welfare programs in place currently of course it's not like a purely capitalist state you couldn't make that case by a long shot um and but he does say that you, you know he, he comes out and says that his problem with with um democratic socialism it he says he has two problems um one show me where it's worked and what would make me feel better and i'm not talking utter about utterly <laughs> homogenous countries with populations of six million people but real con countries real i'm not countries. aware of any place that it has worked uh -huh. um and then he talks about well when the the rehab question which uh to me it, seemed a little bit tangential tangential and, not... and i think that that's him showing his contempt for weakness like he's right. he, what exactly is he saying that he doesn't want taxpayer money expended on people who need to go to rehab or who have too many kids and need to put them in child care is that the idea <laughs> <laughs> who knows yeah his whole his whole sort of rant about fentanyl and marijuana mm. and um rehab not working I mean, to that second question, I'm a big proponent of socialism as, let's say, uh, uh -huh. the, the animating principle behind socialism as a kind of a holdover of Christian charity, which is that um, you give charity, you pool collective resources without asking who they are for and who they're right. going for and how like uh, those people are spending it and this whole welfare queen argument. But as to that initial problem, the, the problem of socialism working or not working, he's absolutely right. And I think that that's like one thing that I will stand by as a person who was born in the last days of communism. Mm hmm. And like, you know, that socialism is a disaster. It was a disaster in the Soviet Union. And there's a mm -hmm. whole 
um, contingent of people who are basically Lenin and Stalin humpers in the United States. And, you know, they are, guess what, entitled and bourgeois and have no idea what living under socialism is like. It's like you you want it. It's very true that my parents' generation of Russians is insufferably, frustratingly pro-West and pro-capitalism. Right. But yeah. you want to know a why? Polish friend who's... Like they waited in bread lines and they had only one type of beige pantyhose and they uh, languished forever in apartment lotteries and they didn't have cars and even cushy uh, academic jobs were hard to come by. And when you can get when you could get one, it was shitty because you had to like avoid like you had to like lie and repress your true feelings because of like censorship and persecution i mean it was a very shitty system sure but what is the alternative well i don't know at I this mean, that's point a- like what is tucker really advocating for because i think that you know neoliberalism has begotten fascism yeah that fascism is essentially its monster mm-hmm. and the only way to combat that is with like a robust left with socialism exact exactly and that's maybe it is disastrous but it's like there isn't a centrist classically liberal option anymore no because things are irreparable no 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 not at all and i think that the fact that people like bernie and aoc exist is ultimately a good thing because they are normalizing at the very base level like uh, ideas that should be should go without saying like i think you know uh maybe the most feasible alternative is market capitalism in terms of like consumer preferences and options and then state regulation in terms of things that should not be run like a business like for example like education namely higher education health care that sort of thing mm-hmm. like uh, something like college or insurance Right. should not be run like top shop but that's how those the scan that's the scandinavian model right that tucker doesn't seem to think would work here i'm not necessarily um convinced of that but there is an argument to be made about the scandinavian model that yes it works primarily in small like ethnically homogenous, homogenous countries right. um and there is a very unsavory unpleasant argument to make that those countries are basically um national socialists <laughs> yeah and that they're they're interested in preserving their the integrity of their borders yes so it's all it's all very complicated but what i'm saying i guess at the end of the day since we're not clairvoyants nor policymakers, and mm-hmm. we're not going to solve the problem of just mere podcasts yeah here. and we're not going to solve this problem tonight but like what i'm proposing is that like um we do consider that sort of complexity that somebody like Tucker Carlson is bringing up because the, the socialist line for a long time uh, or kind of like the ID poll left for a long time has been this hard line socialism or bus narrative Mm -hmm. that like doesn't seem to work, especially when it's coupled with identity politics and the Jacobin people, I don't always agree with them, but I, I do agree with Tucker Carlson that they are among the few people on the left who are like seriously interrogating these issues Mm -hmm. and who who, have like an ideological backbone mm -hmm. and you know they publish they publish articles about like anti-natalism and how it's a bad thing you know i remember that um that was controversial yeah that that it that that issue which was like you know megan and connor and people who actually have kids and can speak to that and wanted to have kids Mm -hmm. Um, so I think like on that, on that token, like he's not entirely wrong. And I also, you know, maybe it's strategic and maybe it's cynical and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the fact that he will go on record to like a liberal outlet like Salon and say like, Hey, I read Jacobin. Sure. I think it's overall pretty cool because the position on the left for a long time has been, uh, no, uh, Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson are bad and then my my <laughs> my position is always like well explain in your own words why they're bad and they can't and that's sure. you know and that's our position toward people like us too it's like well you know these girls are bad these girls are reactionary their ideas are dangerous yeah and i'm like just give me and just you know if you want to be really serious about discourse and progress and everything just tell me in your own words mm-hmm. how anything any of these people have said is bad. And if you can adequately convince me, I'll be sold. Um, 
So there was also the Sheryl Sandberg thing that he brought up that you have the quote of. Should mm-hmm. we talk about that? Yeah. I mean, he makes a lot of points that we um, espouse on this podcast um, in regards to like traditional family models. Um, but he says, where is it? He says, for our ruling class, more investment banking is always the answer. They teach us it's more virtuous to devote your life to some soulless corporation than it is to raise your own kids. Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook wrote an entire book about this. Sandberg explained that her first duty is to shareholders above our own children. No surprise there. Sandberg herself is one of America's biggest shareholders. Propaganda like this has made her rich. Um, What's remarkable is how the rest of us responded to it. Her book became a bestseller, Lean In, as if putting a corporation first is empowerment. It's not. It's bondage, and Republicans should say so. Yeah, and it's female bondage, first and foremost, <laughs> because, again, you like you want to talk about the patriarchy and how that was oppressive to people, and sure, it was, and I think um, uh, Tucker Carlson is is a bit more traditionalist than we are. Yeah. I mean, uh, is, we're not conservative. We're not conservative. And I, but I'm not even socially conservative. <laughs> yeah. I think people should, you know, do whatever. The I think it takes want. all kinds, but yeah. But like at the end of that the day, it should be an option for people to want to stay home with their kids if they want. Yeah. It's just, it but it should be a true choice. But at the end of the day, nobody's like banging the drum to go back to the old model where chicks were like, uh, first under the thumb of their father and then of their husband Mm -hmm. or whatever nobody wants that actually because that's equally drudgerous and shitty but he makes a good point about people like uh cheryl sandberg and about the fact that they are kind of like responsible for this millennial obsession with work because they've cornered people Mm -hmm. and given them like no other choice they've made the fact that a family can't subsist on one income empowering yeah and there's this you know the idea of like not ever talking or or consorting with anyone on the opposite end of the spectrum i was thinking of this in light of like what was going on with um uh, sam harris and jordan peterson leaving patreon and Uh and threatening to start their own patreon alternative Uh um gay treon there's always (laughs) there's already hatreon for like white supremacists um that it's called hatreon Oh, wow. I'm jealous of that. That's a They're really just great name. Leaning into the hate yeah. thing. That's but okay. they they did that because this guy Carl Benjamin, also known as Sargon of Akkad, uh, was banned from Patreon because he said the N word on somebody else's YouTube account. So uh-huh. they had like little spies, little birdies watching him. Not it's not because of anything he did on Patreon, et cetera, et cetera. Anna and I would never even think that we would word. never, never. I would <laughs> never Wait, say what's anything the anti-Semitic. N-word? What's the N word? <laughs> um, That's the only N word you'll hear us say. Um, they, but um, and then at the same time as that news is breaking, there is also news of the fact that um, Mark Zuckerberg was in was integrating Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp Messenger. <laughs> okay, and why not? <laughs> I was like, God, we have like way more to fear from one guy in like a tinfoil hat railing about um, <laughs> chicks and blacks than we do, <laughs> than we do um, uh, from like a guy who is literally mashing together three of the biggest surveillance apps in, right. the, in the history of the world. <laughs> um, he also said, did you see the part where he said, um, what kind of country do you want to live in? A fair country, a decent country, a cohesive co- country, a country that listens to young people who don't live in Brooklyn. <laughs> That's you, Anna. You're <laughs> I'm a young person who doesn't live in Brooklyn. That's when really I, I what... was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I mean. That's really what rubs me the wrong way when my haters are like, would you take advice from a woman with an alt-right haircut who lives in Brooklyn? I'm like, first of all, I have... N- bless you Thank they've you. not lived in brooklyn for mm. like a full four months <clears throat> yeah so suck my dick haters um <laughs> but yeah um i don't know if i want to live in a fair country i think a fair country means an unequal country but i'd rather live in what like, about a cohesive country <laughs> uh that sounds like a, a white only country i don't know none of that matters to me. Um, yeah. no but i do want to live in it in in a country where everybody regardless of their sex race orientation Mm -hmm. um class uh ability Mm -hmm. intellectual ability 
gets the same starter pack universal basic like the basics (laughs) yeah i don't know whatever it takes yeah um but gets gets at least uh a a fighting chance to be moderately solvent and happy and then if you want to become rich and really happy which like those two things are very (laughs) counter they have like an inverse relationship yeah um then it's up to you right but yeah i think you should be able to be a dumbass who can procreate and survive. Right, exactly. And instead of insisting rhetorically that we're all equal at the end of the day, because we're really not on mm-hmm. a cultural level, we're not. Um, some of us are hotter, richer, skinnier, and some of us are poor, fatter, uglier. Po- yeah, uglier. Um, <laughs> instead of insisting on this like rhetorical delusion we should be working to get everybody regardless of their kind of sta- cultural standing to at least a baseline economic standing where they can live with like dignity and respect. Sure. That doesn't sound like a disaster to me. No, it sounds great. <laughs> um, I guess that's our show. Yeah. I don't think Tucker is trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes or trick people who read Jacobin into watching his show. No, I actually don't. I don't think we think should so. give um, people on the left a little more credit. On the right, right? Or, no, the or idea that he's conning leftists oh, into oh, okay. becoming complicit with his soft fascism. <laughs> yeah. um, with a soft physique. I think we can like regard his ideas mm-hmm. um, with a grain of salt. Yeah, and if there's and ever merits. if there if you ever need evidence that the two party system is bunk and mainly about optics, it's like you know, it the shit is cyclical. One, one day the Repub- once in, back in the day the Republican Party was the party of the wealthy elites, and today it's the Democratic Party, and now the Republican Party is scrambling to mm-hmm. appeal to poor rural precarious people, and it's going to happen, you know, vice versa. And like the whole party system is woefully blinkered. And I think he understands that. Sure. Anyway, and that's we'll, all we'll come on say. his show. Yeah. <laughs> if he wants us to show our tits on his show. <laughs> uh, see you in see hell. You now.